Pope. It's that right. one again. Hello everyone and uh, a big warm welcome to the panel this afternoon which is titled Objects of Nostalgia, Materiality in Genre, Film and Television. Okay, so my name is Kim Walden, as it says on the screen, and I'm going to be chairing the panel today. So I'll be introducing the speakers and I'll be making sure everybody keeps to time and then Q, uh, uh, chairing the Q&A. And we have Shelley McMurdo, one of the conference organizers um, in support. So thanks very much, Shelley, um, today. So just a couple of parish notices before we start. Um, Cameras and mics, if you could keep them off, please uh, mute your mic to ensure the smooth running of the panel today. And uh, as you know, we're being recorded. If you don't want to be um, uh, registered on that recording, um, if you keep your camera off and your mic off, you won't feature in the recordings at all. And just to say, uh, with regard to the chat function, can I remind everyone here to please keep the chat clear? Uh, during the speaker's presentation and save your questions until the last speaker has finished when we enter into the Q&A part of the panel. That enables the speakers to share links um, during their presentations if they want to, but also for the pan uh, panel chair to find questions more readily when we get to the Q&A. Okay, so um, without further ado, let's move on to our presentations today. So we've got three presentations for you in this panel, as one of our speakers, Caroline Bain uh, from the University of Minnesota was sadly unable to join us. But our first presenter is Andy McCormack and Andy tells me that he's in Glasgow, um, but he is um, currently at the University of Cambridge where he is a PhD candidate at the Center for Research into Children's Literature. And he has a background in teaching nursery and reception age children. But his current interests are in Jungian literary theory and the tensions between child and adult literatures. His paper today is titled Bleeding Edges, the children's book in comedy and horror. So handing over to you, Andy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kim. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, oh, do I think I might need to be enabled to share my screen. You shouldn't have to be. Let me just check. Hang on. Post disabled participant screen sharing. It's just my. Can you, can you try it now? Technology curse. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Let's see. Share. How's go. that? Is that up on screen? Yeah. Okay, and I'm going to hit F5 to make it start. Or what am I going to do to start the slideshow? Start show. Go, go to slideshow. Ah, there okay. we go. Okay. There we go. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you, Kim, for that introduction. Um, I've titled my talk today, Bleeding Edges, the children's book in comedy and horror. And I'd really like to use this title as a um, kind of structure as well for the talk. So um, I've split it up into four sections. And we're going to start by thinking about the children's book move on to thinking about how it's represented symbolically in comedy, uh, film and television, and then in horror, and finally hope to hope to tie things up um, with thinking about some concepts which might sort of um, come into dialogue with the issues that are raised in the talk. So I'm moving into the final year of my PhD, and these are some of the ideas which are informing that finished project. So it's very much an iterative process and hopefully some of the thinking that comes out today will help me to clarify what's um, going to be in the finished project as well. So let's start thinking then about the children's book. Obviously it's a, a mixed audience today um, and it's lovely to be interacting with so many film and television scholars with the interest that I have in 
culture, you know, beyond the sort of boundaries of, of the book and the library. So a lot of the debate which has characterised the field of children's literature since its kind of inception, you know, as a mode of academic study over the past 30 or 40 years, has been a question of defining what's meant by the children's book. Um, there's a lovely sort of um, aphorism um, from Roger Sale, um, and that everyone knows what children's literature is until they're asked to define it. And I've included some, some pictures here on the side, some fun, um, some fun sort of modes of interrogating this idea of what a children's book is or might be. Um, at the top, we've got a, a, you know, a mother goose figure, an old granny, sharing stories around the campfire. So going back to the kind of oral tradition of, of um, sharing stories around the, her the hearth. Of course, a very close sort of um, relationship to contemporary children's literature today through fairy tales and folklore. But these weren't stories which were originally geared only towards children. Um, you know, they were intergenerational, shared intergenerally, intergenerationally, sort of complicating this idea of what's for children and what's for adults that's that's much more clearly delineated in the publishing market today. Um, we've got a picture of the adult edition of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, you know, very much a children's book, but one which is read by adults and was republished for an adult audience. Um, we've got a little, a little boy there who's um, drawing a lovely picture and I'm sure telling a story um, around what's going on there. So can we define stories which are told by children as children's literature? Um, is children's literature solely the kind of um, domain of adult authors writing for children? A lovely um, addition down at the bottom there, um, the double page spread was just too good not to include. It's from a children's edition of Wuthering Heights, um, which I just adore. So we've got um, retelling classics or, you know, inappropriate texts or dark texts for child readerships. And finally, we've got um, Ina Blyton's Five on Brexit Island. I think it was the best selling um, book at Christmas time a couple of years ago, 2017, I think. I'm sure it'll have done well this year as well. So we've got a, you know, an iconic children's author and um, kind of archetypal children's story being recontextualized for an adult readership. So I want to um, start with these complications to reflect on an interesting mode of research, which is sort of taking hold in the field of children's literature scholarship just now. And it's one that's been developed by Alison Waller. And it's this idea of rereading, which I think speaks quite nicely to the conference themes of nostalgia and as of genre as well. So I'll read this um, this um, quote here from Alison Waller. Nostalgia is conventionally conceived of as suspect for philosophical, psychological, cultural, and moral reasons. Couched as a strong desire to revisit the past for emotional sustenance, it can be critiqued for relying on realist assumptions about the stability of memory over time that have been undermined by theories of fragmentation and reconstruction. Moreover, for adults engaged in nostalgic activity, that urge can be read as solipsistic, childish and even unhealthy in the sense that it reduces the past to a source of gratification and reverses commonly held beliefs about the proper development of adult pleasure and taste. So I want to sort of um, pick up these ideas that, that Waller's raising here about how adults interact with children's literature. And really my project is to observe how the children's book is dramatised in the arena of adult culture, you know, a literature not for children, films, television, um, novels, graphic novels, which are meant for an adult audience, not for a child audience, in which the children's book and adult readers or child readers are, are dramatised. So I'm really looking at how the children's book is displaced across genres and how it brings to light what's been described in a lot of children's literature scholarship as the kind of shadow life of um, the children's book as a work which is created by adults, which could be um, enjoyed by an adult readership, but is um, really intended for children. So I'm going to start with um, comedy and contextualise the children's book in comedy um, using Linda Hutchins' um, idea of the edge of irony or the edge of irony 
um, you know, a sort of comedic parody, comedic recontextualization as something that can pierce, um, you know, a subject. So the relationship between children's literature and comedy is one sort of summed up by Woody Allen, um, who talks about when you do comedy, you're not sitting at the grown up table, you're sitting at the children's table. So there is a shared sort of generic relationship between comedy and children as two modes or two genres which aren't quite afforded the same um, critical space, you know, perhaps as um, realism or you know German expressionism or whatever the example is that you want to you know use when you're thinking about sort of high art and high culture in the academy. Um, Maria Nikolaeva and Clementine Bovey in, their, in the blurb for their 2007 companion to children's literature note that time has passed since having a PhD in children's literature was a funny joke and you've got male um, so they're picking up on this kind of tension of children's literature often being a punchline when children's books are included or recontextualised um, beyond the boundaries of children's literature, um, which takes itself and its, you know, its um, research quite seriously. So I've got some examples here on the side. I've got You've Got Mail, you know, mentioned um, by Bovey and Nikolaeva, in which Meg Ryan is the owner of a children's bookshop. Um, and falls in love with Tom Hanks, the kind of cranky proprietor of a, a, a Borders type chain. I've got a picture of Chandler um, from Friends, which is too good not to use. He's dressed up as a rabbit and um, has a copy of the Velveteen Rabbit in a storyline which sees him vying for the affections of a lover um, against Chandler, against Joey. Um, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, um, this title character there who becomes a children's author. Um, the Vampire Twins of Transylvania Prep, a children's book written in The Simpsons, um, and a, a little gift from Black Books um, where Manny um, undertakes writing a children's book. So in all of these examples, you know, disparate examples across film and television and the comedy genre, we've got the children's book appearing as an object, which is the butt of a, the joke to an extent, you know, the kind of um, traditional trappings of the children's book are, are sort of parodied. Um, in a way that chimes with Bovey and Nikolaeva's sort of assessment of You've Got Mail. But it's also an object which is um, cherished. It's cherished as well as derided and its sort of unique properties are celebrated. It's an object which speaks to mature children and it speaks to, you know, readers, um, mature readers with sophisticated memories of reading as a child and, and a sort of appreciation for the profundity of children's literature as a genre and its sort of um, expansive capacities as a site for thinking about love and justice and these grand ideas. Um, but it's also one which speaks to the childish adult, you know, this figure of um, an unsophisticated adult, you know, Joey Triviani or um, um, Homer Simpson. You know, so it's an object which can connect with um, people from, you know, from it's a kind of intergenerational connector. So this idea sort of introduces the concept of the chronotope, which is something I'd like to talk about um, in the sort of final section of this talk. Of this um, talk, but it's um, you know, there's a sense in which the children's book, when it appears in any other genre and, and comedy. Um, as well, you know, it sort of opens up a different mode of viewing the world. Characters respond to the world a little bit differently when they're holding a children's book in their hand. Things become a bit more magical when through, viewed through the prism of, of what the children's book offers. So moving on now into horror, you know, something of a, a, a conceptual jump from comedy. But actually, you know, there's a, there's a real kind of um, shared... Um, you know, there's a shared ground with the children's book as well, one that's tapped into in comedy. So Kimmy Schmidt, for example, in the sitcom writes a children's novel, which is a means of addressing the trauma of um, her time as a captive in a bunker as a child. Um, so there is a sense in comedy that children's books are a, are a means of encoding, you know, bigger issues than can be addressed sort of um, directly. And this is certainly something which is exploited in the horror genre when the children's book appears. It appears very much as a cover, as a cover for um, darker experiences, um, which are, you know, metaphorized through a children's narrative. 
Um, Dominic Leonard, film scholar, this guy uh, talks about how children's culture is a minefield in the horror film, you know, so this sort of um, very rich ground, you know, um, you know, is shared with um, the relationship between comedy and children's or children's book as well. So I've got some examples here of, you know, movies, the, Bab the Babadook, um, Possum, a British film from a few years ago. Um, I play The Pillow Man and Closet Land, a movie from the 90s, all of which deal with children's authors or, or children's texts, um, which mask trauma. The, they kind of um, operate as sites for healing from trauma for the authors or for child readers um, and have kind of embedded texts, you know, in which these, um, in which these narratives um, come to life. I've included just an image there from Tom Riddle's diary and Harry Potter. You know, it's this kind of trope that um, that works in children's fiction as well as adult culture of a book coming to life, bleeding, seeping into its surroundings. You know, um, that's something that happens in. And you've got Mail when Meg Ryan's talking about a children's book and suddenly she has a vision of her, her ghostly mother coming back to dance with her, you know, in a much darker context than the Baba Duke, you know, the mother there um, reads, you know, a, a kind of um, shadow text, a frightening, frightening iteration of a, a children's book which um, masks her trauma and of course that comes to life through the character of the Baba Duke and haunts her there. So there is a sense in which these um, shadow texts, these shadow texts um, can be brought to life, you know, with the same kind of magical properties of the children's book. There's, of course, been research done for years in terms of the sort of healing potential of um, using children's stories in psychotherapy or children writing narratives to help them to exercise their trauma. But I've just included a couple of scientific studies there, uh, Fivu Chital from 2007 and Borio Nisam and Barak from 2013, um, and a, a literary work by Kenneth Kidd from 2011, which, cons which considers trauma fiction, which questions, you know, the children's book capacity for re-traumatising as well as healing and how it's something which is age dependent you know, um, exercises and using fairy tales or archetypal stories might be appropriate for adults and they're not for children. So again, there's this idea of the chronotope, you know, a, a, a narrative which embodies adult trauma um, could be, you know, it could be a healing process to recontextualise it as a, as a kind of archetypal folk, folkloric narrative for children, but it's one which is for an adult audience, you know, it's for an adult readership, which is, um, which is appropriate for children on another on another level. So to move finally then into some concepts, some kind of literary or philosophical concepts, which can tie together, um, you know, this sort of generic recontextualization of the children's book as a physical object, as a physical trope, across across you know the kind of arenas of genre, um, of elliptic comedy and horror, but um, you know from some other you know, science fiction I've, I've been looking at as well, um, and realism, and trying to find some sort of recurring uses of the children's book. So um, the Bactinian idea of the chronotope is one that I keep coming back to. Um, this is a concept that Bactin defined as the intrinsic connectedness of temporal and spatial relationships that are artistically expressed in literature. Um, Maria Nikolaeva, you know, a children's literature scholar, um, translated that from the Russian in another in another way as a unity of time and space. So this is a concept which is sort of perfectly embodied, I think, by the children's book as an object, symbolic object, when it appears in the kind of adult imagination, film, television, and, and um, you know, across all media for an adult audience. Um, in that the children's book ties up the past and the present and the future just in its very in its very essence it's a site intended for a child readership perhaps written by a child but which is which is open to interpretation for adult rereading you know it has adult resonance it speaks to the childish adult to the sophisticated adult as well as it does to the child um this kind of Function, this kind of functioning um, 
as a kind of perfect embodiment of the concept of the chronotope, you know, goes beyond, um, or its usefulness can be, enha can be enhanced by thinking of it in this kind of archetypal sense, this perfect embodiment of the concept of the chronotope, um, which leads me to think about this kind of Jungian idea of the, of the archetype. Um, which, which I'm sure will be familiar to to most, um, you know, as a kind of popular term. But thinking about it and Jung's um, going back to his original idea of the archetypes, um, he wrote about the psychoid archetypes using the analogy of the color spectrum to illustrate that objective reality is forces which shape rather than find mere expression in their personal. Thanks, Kim. Oh couple of minutes. Um, rather than find mere expression in their personal, social and literary vessels more discernible to the human eye. So there's an idea in which, um, you know, the children's book is, is a, is a, as an archetypal object, you know, reproduced across genres in literature, um, is able to embody and give meaning to the kind of real phenomenon of the chronotope and sort of um, embody that phenomenon in literature. Um, so the sense of the children's book as well as embodying the chronotope embodies Jung's own idea of visionary, liter visionary, liter visionary literature, you know, literature's capacity for encoding and embodying you know, almost kind of inexpressible, you know, sublime ideas, I think, of the chronotope is one of which, um, in which the children's book, you know, um, kind of embodies as well in terms of the possibilities that, um, you know, it encodes, which are exploited across all adult genres. So just to finish then um, by returning to Alison Waller um, and this project of remembering, she writes about how childhood fiction can remain crucial throughout an individual's life journey. Childhood books do not need to be portals to the supernatural in order to be extraordinary forces in our lives. Naming, remembering and rereading as ordinary everyday and ongoing practices with resonance across the life course opens up, a new, opens up new avenues for thinking about how adults read children's literature. So I'm just going to leave it there um, and thank you very much for listening and um, look forward to hearing my colleagues' presentations and um, to answering any questions or, or hearing any comments that might be raised by, by these ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy, for an absolutely fascinating start to the panel. That was brilliant. OK, so um, Andy, if you can unshare the screen. Okay, um, pause, share. How's that? Stop, share. Cool. Lovely. Excellent. Okay, and um, if I can ask you then to uh, turn off your camera and mic, um, Andy, well, that's not a problem for you because you have no camera, just your mic. Lovely. Okay, so thank you to him. And uh, let's move on now to the second presenter this afternoon, who is Jiri who, um, Jiri Anger, who is coming um, to us from, turn off the clock, um, from uh, Prague. So like Andy, uh, Jiri is a PhD candidate, uh, but he's also the editor of the journal Illuminace, as well as a sometime curator of special collections at the Czech National Film Archive. He has, or is about to publish, in the European Journal of Media Studies, studies in Eastern European cinema and sight and sound among other journals. His research focuses on archival film, experimental cinema and film criticism. And he's also authored a monograph titled in translation, Effect, Expression, Performance and Transformation of the Melodramatic Excess of the Cinema of the Body. Okay, so Jury's title today is The Milestone That Never Happened, uh, Digital Krizinecki, I knew I'd get that wrong, Krizinecki, False Archive Effect and the beginning, failed beginning of the Czech cinema. Thank you. Over to you, Jury. 
Okay, so uh, thank you, Dr. Walden, to, for introducing me. It's a real, real pleasure to be here. And please just let me share my screen. Uh, can everyone see, see me? Can you hear me fine? Yeah, great. Okay, great. So uh, I would like to start uh, by showing you a very specific uh, film around which the main argument of this paper is structured. It's a film called Dostavenichko. Vemlinici, or if you like to translate it, an assignation in the mail. It's one of the first Czech films ever and a sort of symbolic moment that marks the birth of Czech cinema. And also, and this is really cru crucial for my argument, it's really interesting as an archival artifact, as an archival document, as an archival object that not only uh, shows some great milestone in the history of Czech cinema, but it's also riddled with contradictions, ambiguities, and paradoxes that ask us sort of to reevaluate our notion of what an archival document is and what makes us recognize certain films or footage as historical documents. So I'm just going to show you it's just like 40 seconds. Okay, so uh, this, uh, uh, as you had a chance to see, uh, this is the film which was recently digitized and released uh, by the Czech National Film Archive on Blu-ray. It's sort of divided into two parts. The first part shows us the so-called first Czech actor, Josef Malostranský, unveiling a poster with the title Czeski Cinematograph or Czech Cinematograph, which literally invited the visitors of the exhibition of architecture and engineering in Prague to come and see the first Czech films. And then the film proceeds with sort of a primitive fictional story of a failed date, where it sort of escalates into violence and complete chaos. Yet, what interests me the most about this material is something that happens in between when the first segment ends, is interrupted, and the story that begins with uh, two characters in the midst of the kiss starting to evolve. And, but instead of seeing how this kisses, this first kiss materializes, we see those very really intense physical material interventions, those scratches that make the events, uh, the, figure, the figures hardly recognizable. And curiously enough, this sort of fractured divide also reflects the fact that the uh, vintage nitrate print, which was digitized, was sort of torn in two, it in, survived in two separated parts, which had to be like scanned separately and stitched back together. And so we've got this, like not only the film in itself, but also a really uh, over the historic, over the determined nitrate print as an object. And the crack that we can see between those two separate parts becomes an emblem of a much wider problem of some kind of a crack between figuration, which means what is really represented and figured in the image, the visible, recognizable people and objects, and the materiality, the ravages of time, decay, that isn't just a, a random, ordinary sign of aging, 
but also a full-fledged material, uh, figurative, meaning-making actor, which also brings me to the central problem that I'm going to uh, address in this paper, which is how to conceptualize an archival document whose materiality intervenes in its meaning. What happens when what we perceive as an archival document becomes changed, altered to such an extent that it's barely recognizable. How to address this crack between figuration and materiality and how to how it makes us redefine the epistemological aspects of what makes us believe that an image, a film, is an archival document. Uh, one concept which can help us address this question is Jamie Barron's notion of the archive effect, perhaps. Uh, many of you know this, this book, which was published in 2014, and it really deals with these kinds of images that bring us into contact with the past, which highlight the distance between then and now, and also show how the context, whether uh, uh, whether representational or technological, has changed between the then uh, when the film was shot and the now when we are what we are watching it. And crucially, there is also an important methodological shift when archive or object isn't just something that is stored, that has some essential characteristics, but it's mainly and crucially an experience of reception, that really the epistemology and there means perception is the main thing that uh, uh, shows what is or what uh, what is an archival document or what it can be. And this uh, book offers us a really clever uh, conceptual framework to address even such uh, historical overdetermined archival artifacts such as Dostavenichko. Yet, when we, if we wanted to come to terms with this crack, with this punctured surface, uh, we need to uh, uh, develop these ideas and concepts further and also sometimes read them against the grain. Because uh, one of the things about Jamie Barnes' argument is that she mainly focuses really on what is depicted in the image, again, on the visible figures. And when she focuses on materiality, it is something that is clearly separate or isolated from uh, the figuration as some, she mostly sees it as really those like dots, dust and scratches that we see in every archival material, which or some are kind of marks of its aging. I do not really affect the, uh, the figurative processes to such a high extent. So, and what is, but what is uh, important in the context of this conference, uh, the, on, what, the only major passage of the book in which she addresses materiality is in uh, the subchapter, subchapter which is focused on nostalgia. There is this subchapter, the archive effect and nostalgia when she goes on to analyze films such as Bill Morrison's The Keisha, The State of Decay, perhaps many of you have seen this film, and she interprets it uh, using the complex conceptual framework by Svetlana Boyle, the restorative and reflective nostalgia, and kind of shows how both of those modes of nostalgia are present in this film. But, uh, seeing this experimental punk footage film through the lens of nostalgia has always seemed kind of strange to me, not only to me as a spectator, but also as a theorist, because uh, the film, even though some of the 
you might probably interpret it that way, isn't for me about yearning for the clear imagery of the past that is hidden behind decay that existed before it and beyond it. The decay is really something that assumes a primary function. It's something that not only uh, intervenes with the figuration and also communicates with what it was formerly represented in the image, as you can see in this shot where Boxer fights with a amorphous material blob. It also shows not a world which is a necessary world of the past, but also world of the prison, a world that is no longer recognizable, that is uh, uh, whose perception is clouded for us and world that is uh, no longer, uh, and also an archival document that uh, is really torn between those two spheres of figuration and materiality, which are both distinctive and full-fledged actors. And if we look at uh, the Stalinichko and especially the Craig in this way, it can really help us uh, show uh, not that uh, this, these scratches erase the archive effect, but paradoxically make it richer and more aesthetically and conceptually generated. And for this, well, to be more specific, about the function of the scratches and what do these scratches do, uh, we can use other concepts coined by uh, Jamie Barron, just here for clarity. We, uh, let me just add this information. Uh, she counts uh, with, in the second chapter, she counts with the notion of a false archive effect. And this effect arises in materials uh, which, either consciously or unconsciously, under, uh, exploit but also undermine our belief in the footage as a historical document with certain kind of truth value. Yeah, and she goes on to examine the specific practices such as stage reenactments forging or doctoring of documents, juxtaposition of different layers of representation, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, if we somehow really develop the argument further, we can also see the scratches of other kinds of material physical interventions as uh, uh, powers of the force of its own, as certain uh, strategies and practices that can uh, problematize but also enrich the archival experience, some kind of broaden uh, what, which factors, which dimensions of the moving image can make us accept certain materials as archival documents. And in this sense, the fracture divide, the crack, can be uh, understood as a sort of unintentional power of the false, which blurs the content, reveals some kind of broader implications of the film as archival object, as an archival artifact. So, and to be like more specific, again, if we read the false archive effect through Tijanesky's film and vice versa, we can come up, or at least I have come up uh, with three functions of these scratches. The first function uh, in regards to the archive effect. The first function is that we can understand those scratches as some kind of indices without clear origin. Something which Mary Don Doan and Catherine grew after her term, the hollowed out signs, signs that are uh, limited to the assurance of existence that we don't know who is responsible, we don't know the what, we don't know the when, we don't know the why. In this case, it was probably 
uh, caused by improper handling by film ride workers, but we'll never know for sure. And, but where they think that is certain is that the indices are there and somehow alter the image as it has been known to us. And in this case, again, I'm reminding you that the film is not only divided uh, into two parts, uh, only on the level of representation, but it is, but the film role is literally uh, cut up, is literally torn. And in this case, uh, the indices, a certain power of the false, is something that reveals, reminds us of the sutured character of the material. So this is the first function. The second function is we can understand them and again, a bit of speculation as some kind of primitive form of editing because probably as many of you know, uh, the earliest days of cinema in 1898, the idea of editing as we know it right now, yet had to be invented. It was mostly, mostly just one scene or a tableau. Uh, and if there were more shots, they usually just followed upon each other. And this is also the case if we wanted to read Dostavinskoy in the traditional way. But here, as we have the scratches, a clear indicator that the horizon or the scene has changed, we can think of this fracture divide as something that gives this transition or bridge or high, a higher meaning and asks us to reflect what does this uh, uh, shift from one scene to another mean. So really accept it as some kind of primitive form, but also reflects a form of editing. And the third part, and perhaps you will uh, recognize the Agamben Agambinian vocabulary. Scratches can be also uh, then portrayed as kind of gestures that do not necessarily express anything, but that point to the intrinsic vulnerability and incompleteness and of all the figurative material processes that we are seeing. Because as historians, theorists and archivists, we only want, we often want uh, the scenes or the, mo the pregnant moments that we want to remember to have a clear beginning middle and the end. We wanted to save them, restore them uh, using the best quality available, retouch them, etc. But in this case, uh, the scratches remind us that somehow these early pregnant moments will always remain uh, open, unfinished and open to other interpretations. So there we have uh, there we have some kind of film strip that will always be torn in two. We have a poster introduction that will always be interrupted. And perhaps most crucially, the first case that will never truly materialize in its entirety. Sure, there are many cases that follow uh, after it, but the first case in Czech cinema becomes partially hidden. So. These are the three main functions. And just to conclude, uh, I, my aim was to show how uh, film artifacts such as Dostavenichko are certain minor, marginal, historic overdone paradoxical film objects that might be a step towards film theory and history that acknowledges the permanent absences and powers of the false as something inherent that doesn't have to be saved or repaired, something like that. As many of you, of course, recognize that this is part of the uh, huger historiographic project proposed by Catherine Brew in her recent book, Bad Film Histories from uh, 2019. And just to show you really briefly 
where we possible to go next. Uh, as uh, already indicated, I'm interested in experimental film and videographic film studies and such moments that uh, are never finished, but constantly repeat to haunt us. Uh, moments that bear certain nostalgic uh, sentiments, yet we are never really able to approach them, are excellent material for making compilations, video essays, or even GIFs. So I've made, mm -hmm. so I've made uh, a few exercises. I'm going to show you just really quickly. For example, one GIF, which really shows, uh, isolates the crack and shows it to really understand it as a main point uh, on which uh, uh, the argument is focused. This really slowed down. And the, the other type uh, is something, some kind of build up for a larger project, uh, which is called the first case, which really shows the scene in all the material forms you're, in which it appeared throughout history. So not only the original materials, but also compilations, TV shows, retrospectives, and things like that. So just to show you how it looks, this is the vintage print. This is the original negative. And it's interesting that uh, in every instance, it, yeah, uh, it looks different. It is something new. Sometimes the fracture divide is completely missing. Sometimes the scene is shorter, sometimes it's longer. Of course, there are different material characteristics. And uh, this I'm hoping to develop into a longer project that will hopefully be published. So this is all from me. And thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to the discussion. You're muted, Kim. I'm muted. Okay, I'm not muted now. Thank you, Jiri. That was absolutely fascinating. Really in in interesting indeed. Which brings us to uh, our third uh, speaker today, who is Krista Van Ralter, who is presenting a paper that she has co-written with Thomas Hassel. And a few words about Krista before she does her presentation. Krista is from Bournemouth University in the UK, where she is the Deputy Dean for Education in the Faculty of Media and Communications. And her current interests include gender in science fiction and action films, narrative in complex TV, and diversity in the media industries. Her co-writer, Thomas, recently graduated uh, with a BA in script writing from Bournemouth. And the title of their paper today is Playing with the Past, Structures of Nostalgia in Ready Player One. So thank you. Off you go, Crystal. All right, okay, let's see if I can see if I can pull this off appropriately. Is that mm, have I done it? Yes. Brilliant. Okay. First day. Oh, good. Now I can't see it. Right. Okay. Okay. Doke. Aha. Okay. Right. Um, I have to say that this actually, the inspiration for this came from a paper written by Thomas, but he hasn't actually been involved in the latter stages of pulling this together. So the, if it's a slightly rambling attempt at making sense of of, of this, then um, I take all the blame for that. Um, okay, so Christmas number one for uh, for 2020 apparently was Last Christmas by Wham, as recorded in 1984. It seems there's an endless appetite for 1980s nostalgia, or rather nostalgia for 1980s pop culture. In science fiction, we see this expressed in the success of Stranger Things, which has been discussed quite a lot at this conference. And in the science fiction film, in the popularity of the last decade of new films with 1980s roots, whether they be prequels, sequels, remakes or reboots. The most recent of these being Wonder Woman 1984, I think that's the most recent, a film 
outstanding for the complete arbitrariness of that date as it is for the shamelessness with which its title betrays its nostalgic wares. Ready Player One differs somewhat from these examples because it's neither a sequel nor a prequel nor a remake nor a reboot. It is an original film or a film based on an original book and one for which 1980s nostalgia defines not just the attraction for audiences, but the plot. Nostalgia here being both affect and theme. Ready Player One is based on the 2011 book of the same name by Ernst Klein, who also co-wrote the script with Zach Penn and was directed by Steven Spielberg. It's set in a dystopian future when we're told everyone has given up on trying to solve problems and now just tries to outlive them. A hero, Wade Watts, lives in the stacks, massive vertically extended trailer park where people spend most of their time in a virtual world called the Oasis, created and owned by a giant tech company, Gregarious Games. James Halliday, the multimillionaire games designer who owns Gregarious Games, dies and uh, leaves the whole of his fortune and control of the company to whoever can find the Easter egg he is hidden in the oasis. Success in this quest depends on an encyclopedic knowledge of 1980s pop culture, Halliday's personal obsession. Aspiring egg hunters or gunters must study Halliday's life and likes forensically for clues. And to help them, Halliday has made available a journal. In the book, this is an almanac in the film, a virtual museum run by a, a, a strange robotic curator. Um, and this is where the gunters can come to study. Meanwhile, rival tech giant IOI is determined to take over the Oasis, charging for access and filling the space with advertising. IOI CEO Nolan Sorrento is a soulless corporate suit whose ruthless business practices include the so-called loyalty centers where the company's debtors are locked up and used as indentured labor while they work off their debt and ordering the assassination of individuals who get in his way, like our hero. Most heinous of all, he does not appreciate 1980s pop culture, but has to employ a team of super geeks to coach his army of sixers, so-called for the numbers of their uniforms, who operate in the virtual world of the Oasis, where they also hunt for the egg. The Gunter's quest is thus elevated from a mere search for personal enrichment to a campaign to save the virtual world from an evil superpower. The action takes place partly in the virtual world of the Oasis, where the search is led by Parseval, Wade's better looking avatar, Artemis, his love interest, and H, his best friend, and partly in the real world, where the real life identities of Wade's, Wade's various friends are gradually revealed with some surprises. The plot, the dialogue, and above all, the visual rendition of the Oasis are replete with 1980s pop culture references from Parseval's DeLorean, borrowed from Back to the Future, to the Mecha Godzilla avatar adopted by Sorrento in the final battle, with endless visual, verbal, and oral asides scattered along the way. What is perhaps most interesting about this film is the way in which nostalgia as affect and nostalgia as theme are woven together folded together, if you like, in a Deleuzian fashion to engulf and engage the audience in a way typical of the neo-Baroque text as conceptualized by Angela Indelianis, a text that can continually exceeds the boundaries of the frame, engulfing its audience in a surprisingly complex web of nostalgia. Thus, even in the context of the Hollywood high concept movie, we find nostalgia in the words of Catherine Neymar, a liminal, ambiguous phenomenon. On one level, Ready Player One is a classic example of Paul Grange's nostalgic mode, a creation driven by technology and marketing, and puts one in mind of Mark Fisher's quip that those who can't remember the past are condemned to have it resold to them forever. But the nostalgic mood of loss and longing is also to be found in various guises, in fact, there are at least three different kinds of nostalgia thematically portrayed in this film and echoed in its nostalgic affect. Firstly, there's Halliday's own nostalgia for the pop culture that provided him with a refuge from his unhappy youth and for his lost love, undeclared and unrequited. 
Halliday is a melancholic in the Freudian sense, unable to give up the lost object of desire and mourn and move on. His nostalgia is also extremely narcissistic in the way described by Ryan Lizardi in his concept of the individualized playlist past. His extraordinary power as the creator of the Oasis, um, illustrated here by his character, his avatar of Anorak, the wizard, um, and as owner of Gregarious Games, enables him to impose his cultural playlist on the rest of humanity. The book hints at the dark side of this potentially abusive relationship. In the film, however, any such suggestion is brushed aside by Mark Rylance's portrayal of a kindly, if distracted, genius. Halliday's diegetic nostalgia speaks directly to a mature audience, to those raised like Ernest Cline on 1980s pop culture, and indeed those of the generation who created it, like Spielberg, a director who has declared that he lives in nostalgia. The second kind of nostalgia portrayed in the film is the Gunter's emotional investment in a past they have never known. For them, 1980s is a myth, the 1980s is a myth rather than a memory. Indeed, we might call her their experience post-nostalgia after Hirsch's post-memory or possibly prosthetic nostalgia after Anson Lamberg's prosthetic memory. This second order nostalgia, as Linda Hutchinson says, is no longer has to rely on individual memory or desire thanks to technology that can be fed forever by quick access to an infinitely recyclable past. Of course, the Gunters are more or less obliged to obsess over 1980s pop culture by the terms of Halliday's will. But it's made clear that those worthy of the prize are genuine fans, reveling in their own knowledge as well as the artifacts themselves. In this, they are closely aligned with the main target audience interpolated by the film, the 15 to 20 somethings for whom, as the plethora of websites devoted to these things demonstrate, a key pleasure on offer is pop culture bingo. The geeky pleasure in arcane and useless knowledge and in iconography associated with the Baikal age. This leads me to another level on which the film addresses the theme of and exploits the effects of nostalgia. The oasis itself. In coining the term nostalgia, Boyer described a frequently fatal form of homesickness, the difficult for the physician being that a return home did not cure the patient. And this was because the longing described by nostalgia was not in fact a longing for a place, but a longing for an earlier time. And given that time, unlike space, is unidirectional and irreversible, a cure was elusive. I would suggest that the oasis in Ready Player One represents the displacement of that time back onto place. The Gunters and indeed the rest of the population, it seems, escape to the oasis from their daily lives because it is a place of wish fulfillment. And from what we see of it in the film, notwithstanding some passing references to less wholesome pursuits, it is a place of a childlike place, a place of simplicity, a place where monsters can be clearly identified and duly slain, a place where life is reduced to a quest in which one can find the lost object of desire, as well as reliably scoring points from one's successes and being properly rewarded for one's valiant deeds. The longing satisfied by the oasis in that respect is the longing for a half remembered, half mythical past. For the film's audience, the Oasis offers a souped up sword and sandals type of adventure in common with space opera and superhero movies that have filled our cinema screens the last two decades with their quasi medieval battles and their quasi medieval, quasi -medieval values. It is moreover a space where science fiction meets fantasy, a space ruled by Arthur C. Clarke's third law, where technology and magic are largely indistinguishable and where time itself is reversible. In short, it is a space that represents lost childhood. So, needless to say, there's a dark side to all this self-indulgence, whether Halliday's own or that of his on-screen and off-screen disciples. This is to some degree explicitly acknowledged within the film, and to some degree haunts the text, as Fisher might have it, in the form of the illusions in the plot, the logic, and the moral mapping of the film, in what Pierre Macquarie would call the not said. I'd like to briefly explore these three elements, these, um, three key themes here uh, that touch on those elements, the imagined future, the price of escapism and the operations of capitalist realism. The contradictions here have, I would argue, the flavor, if not all the ingredients of the tensions between Bohm's reflective and restorative nostalgias. 
Critics from Jameson to Berman to Fisher have been exercised about science fiction's ability to imagine a future that actually makes sense in terms of the present of its own creation. So Blade Runner 2049, for example, for all its merits, cannot help but commit to a vision of the future predicated on the perspective of 1982. However, I would argue Ready Player One in its depiction of the real world of 2045 does successfully manage a future for which the, uh, twin, uh, the early 21st century represents a viable past, such that it might be said to successfully perform the historicizing role that Jameson ascribes to science fiction genre. The film envisages a dystopian future that has seen life as we know it fizzle out, not with a bang, but with a whimper, succumbing to an incremental burden of pressures and crises rather than a single apocalyptic event. In the book, these include pandemics and virulent flu strains, although the film favors more technologically themed disasters, such as the so-called bandwidth wars. It is a future where people live in tiny boxes and spend all their time in a virtual online alternative universe, imagine. It is a world where the population's economic role is primarily as consumers rather than producers, and one dominated by large predatory media companies run by white men. Failure to imagine the future, moreover, is explicitly um, a shortcoming ascribed to the diegetic population. People have given up trying to solve problems and just try to outlive them, mainly by hiding away in the oasis, where the clutter of decontextualized 1980s iconography, alongside the population of gods and monsters, successfully distracts them from any attempt to fight for a better future in the real world providing, if not bread, then an infinite supply of circuses to keep them as effectively enslaved as the inhabitants of IOI's loyalty centers. On the other hand, the visual and narrative force of the Oasis overpowers this vision, dominating the tone as well as the plot of a film in a way that supports Fisher and Jameson's pessimistic vision of a degraded culture recycling the past as blank parody. The 80s in this respect is of course no more uh, designates that actual decade, then the 50s represents the real period of time in Philip Dick's Time Out of Joint, as discussed by Jameson back in the real historical year of 1982. It's a myth constructed largely of pop culture references, themselves a kind of partial, unreliable self-portrait of the time. In fact, in some respects, Ready Player One has taken this kind of post-nostalgia to its logical conclusion. Unlike Stranger Things or Wonder Woman 1984, it doesn't even pretend to engage with the period itself or to contextualize the cultural references plundered from the historical past. Instead, it abstracts and condenses its references to present precisely the glossy sheen of pastness that for Jameson is the opposite of historicity, rendered with all the overwrought sensuality of the oasis. Okay, escapism. One of the prominent clues Halliday plants in the quest for the Easter egg is escape your past. In the context of the diegesis, this oddly phrased exhortation seems addressed primarily at Halliday himself rather than the players. They are arguably trapped in his playlist past by the terms of the quest, unable to escape until all the riddles are solved. On the other hand, by foregrounding the concept of escape, the film highlights the degree to which the players use the Oasis to escape from their present and indeed their future in the real world. In the book, Halliday's partner, Ogden Morrow, leaves Gagarin's games because it has become a self-imposed prison for humanity, a pleasant place to hide from its problems while human civilization slowly collapses, primarily due to neglect. The Oasis here is clearly implicated as a contributory cause of the real life malaise, um, rather than simply a salve. In the film, the suggestion's toned down into a scene in the museum in which Og tries to get Halliday to accept that Oasis is no longer just a game and that he now has responsibilities for the impact of his creation. In response to which Halliday, already a melancholy figure, expresses his wish to go backwards, thus both encapsulating a key theme of the film and giving Parsifal, as it happens, a critical clue to the quest. The film nevertheless does make it clear that too much escapism is problematic. Indeed, Spielberg describes it as a cautionary tale about leaving us the choice of where we want to exist. Do we want to exist in reality, he says, or do we want to exist in escapist universe? Those themes were so profound for me. 
Meanwhile, in the film itself, Halliday extols the virtues of reality, telling Wade with a nod to Woody Allen, reality is the only place you can get a decent meal and somewhat tautologically, only reality is real. And indeed, the film does offer a ray of help, a ray of hope for the real world in the form of Artemis's rooftop dwelling friends who call themselves the Rebellion and whose restorative credentials are demonstrated by growing vegetables in the midst of urban decay. Nevertheless, the entire impetus of the film is to revel in the more visually exciting and engaging world of the Oasis. One is reminded of Zizek's structure of disavowal, whereby so long as in our hearts we know it's wrong, we can give ourselves permission to participate in a morally and politically bankrupt system, which brings us to Mark Fisher's concept of capitalism realism and the aphorism ascribed to both Jameson and Franklin that it is easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. I would suggest that it is most, most certainly easier for the makers of the film, its protagonists, and arguably the audience it constructs to imagine the end of the world than a future without capitalism. As is so often the case in Hollywood movies, what we find in Ready Player One is that evil exploitative capitalism, as represented by Sorrento in the impersonally titled IOI, is contrasted with a benevolent alternative as represented by Halliday and the friendly sounding gregarious games. IOI's capture of what Sorrento refers to as the world's most important economic resource would be disastrous because it would create a monopoly there are no antitrust laws, apparently, in 20, 2045. Um, and because excessive monetization through advertising would destroy the user experience. This can only be avoided if Wade and his friends can get financial control of the company instead. There are no other options. In fact, given the desperate state of affairs in 2045, it's clear that capitalism has in fact failed as a viable system in the real world. However, it has simply migrated to the virtual where everybody now effectively lives. Their actions defined by and focused on the accumulation of virtual wealth and commodities. Indeed, the Oasis can be seen as an allegory of Debord's uh, society of the spectacle, where the drive to accumulate commodities has usurped the drive to survival, where the exchange value has replaced use value almost entirely. When somebody is killed in the Oasis, they zero out, meaning they lose all they've accumulated in terms of weapons, artifacts, etc. And on screen, we see them dissolve into a shower of coins. The contradictory nature of this film's re relationship with nostalgia and pop culture is illustrated by the substitution of The Shining for Blade Runner as the location for a key stage in the quest. On the one hand, the substitution supports a general sense of cultural references divorced from context or meaning, the two iconic 1980s films have an equivalent exchange value, even though the exchange in this case means abandoning the original clue, continue your quest by taking the test, meaning Blade Runner's Void Camp test, and substituting the rather less resonant retrace your steps, escape your past. This does not really have a great deal to do with The Shining, which proves to be a red herring in the plot. On the other hand, The Shining is the ultimate autological text, with a great deal to say about the perils of interleave timelines, but this aspect of the reference is not developed. Instead, it becomes one of many references which seem in neo-baroque fashion to exceed the bounds of the text, hinting at possible interpretation beyond, yet at the same time shrinking from exposing the disturbing underbelly of the film itself. In this case, we move swiftly into comedy horror zombie routine that once again floats free of context. In much the same way, the interrelation of past, present, future, of signifier and signified, and of reality and fantasy, and the spectres of the unsaid that haunt the film, all slip from the grasp, offering only oxymoron and contradiction to define the structures of nostalgia in and around Ready Player One. Okay. <laughs> Have I stopped? Have I stopped sharing successfully? You have, yeah. Kim, you're on mute. Hi. Yes, you have, Krista. Thank you very much for that presentation and thank you to Thomas as well. So we now move into the uh, Q&A part of our panel. 
today and I'd like to ask the speakers please to put their cameras on and their mics on so that they can respond to any questions that arise. And of course, you have two ways in which you can ask questions. You can either put up a hand or wave or clap or something, or ask uh, questions via the chat. Perhaps while people are thinking about their questions, I'll, I, I have a, a small sort of methodological question I wanted to ask Andy, if I may. Andy, are you yep, there? Yeah, of course. Yep. Hi. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really not terribly interesting, but I was just wanting to know how um, you talked about having collected a um, hundred texts, having created a corpus of a hundred texts, mm -hmm. um, films that reference children's books. I just wondered how you made that uh, collection. Did you do it through personal encounter or did you do it in some other systemic way? I, I, I encountered problems like that in my own research and I'm always endlessly interested in what other people did. Yes, yeah, it's very, it's, it's very tricky. It's very tricky, and you know, whenever I hear anybody who's engaging in a, a similar kind of project, I'll always ask them what they've done as well. In fact, when I was just starting the project, I went to the launch of a book by Melissa Terras, who published a, a study of professors as they are represented in picture books. Um, so she, she was someone whose brains I picked as to her um, methodology and kind of um, engaged in quite a similar one, um, sort of using library and publishing databases. But I, I came up with quite a with quite a bit of um, difficulty in trying to search for fictional children's books or embedded children's books because, of course, all the results are just children's books. That's um, <laughs> so it was quite frustrating. So also, you know, a methodology that, that um, Melissa Terras kind of embeds in her study is using sort of academic communities and social media. So um, I sort of conducted a few um, sort of studies via, you know, online networks of children's literature scholars and um, through, you know, sort of having conversations with, with colleagues at, you know, at, at conferences and different events like that. So I got to a point where I generated a, a list of about a um, hundred texts and I thought, okay, now it's time to start um, categorising and accepting the, the imperfect, you know, how imperfect it is and trying to generate an exhaustive list. Well, that's interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody got any questions for any of our speakers today? Matt has his hand raised there, Kim. Who? Matthew Leggett. Sorry, I can't see any hands raised. Where's that? Hey. Whoever has their hands raised, hey. speak. Hey, now. <laughs> hi, hi, uh, Kim, thanks. Um, yeah. Uh, Krista, th thanks for that. I, I'm really frustrated because I missed the first few minutes of your of your paper. It was really interesting, and uh, I have to go back and watch the recording. This is the advantage of the technological world we're inhabiting. Um, I've actually just finished re uh, writing a piece on Ready Player One and I, I, I touched on quite a lot of the things that you were saying, but I kind of had a slightly different take on it, which was actually I'm, I'm kind of upset about what Spielberg did to the um, utopian aspects that I see embedded in the novel. So I'm actually, in a way, you know, when, when you're, I think towards the end you started talking about how, um, you know, the film kind of gets lost in its spectacle. And I don't disagree with that, but, and, and there is a kind of contradictory message there, really embedded in that, that I don't know if you mentioned at the beginning, but the, the ending, which, where, where essentially they limit the amount mm. of time you can spend in the Oasis. And I was kind of really upset by that ending. I don't know how you felt about it, but the whole premise of uh, the novel really from, from, uh, from Klein is that, um, you know, a kid comes from nothing and has all this, you know, has all these opportunities that he wouldn't otherwise have without this fantastic technology. And it's quite evident from, from Klein's writing that he's obsessed with this technology. He's in a way that Spielberg is not. He's kind of a reluctant, um, uh, he says in an interview that he loves video games, but you wouldn't get that sense from the film he's produced because he's actually a real cinephile and he's very, 
kind of um, you know suspicious about the role that sort of convergence is playing in in um, uh, in cinema. So I, I just I found that really uh, annoying because there's so few. Uh, I, I'm I'm a kind of utopianist, and I, I actually think there's very few texts that really get to this idea that. Um, building a, a utopia is something possible rather than something to aspire towards. And actually, the whole point of Klein's text is that actually this technology does exist. We can build fantasy worlds to our own, to our heart's content in a, in a way. And and he kind of strips that message out of it and, and leaves it really empty. I think I don't. I just wondered what you felt about that. You know, did you? I mean, it sounds like you you've clearly sort of invested in a novel as well. And and whether you thought that one was more successful than the other. I, I agree. I mean, I agree with you on a lot of fronts there. I mean, obviously, gaming is incredibly important in the book and is lost. Although they're gaming all the time, but somehow that's not what you feel like when you're watching mm. it. Um, he, there is a moment in the in the film um, when Wade says something about the fact that these artifacts are left lying around so anyone can get one and anyone can... But you get a much stronger sense of just accumulating. And I think that thing of seeing every time somebody dies, it's like coins appear. You know, that sense of accruing wealth is, is different, I think, than in, the, than in the novel. I think the other thing that's very interesting is, of course, in the novel, he, um, the, way he, the way he's successful is because he sort of, he plays successfully and because the, because the accrual of wealth in the Oasis turns into real world, he gets to get all this gear and he gets to get this fantastic apartment. He, he gets to basically have a setup that clearly looks like what we see as Sorrento setup. Whereas of course in the film, we keep him as the underdog with the sort of grungy back of an RV effort. Um, so, you know, yeah, there is a very different spin, but I think the thing that was interesting to me is in the book that the sense of the dark side does come through very powerfully every now and then. You know, there are lines that really evoke the waste, that the Matrix when they, he describes what he looks like. There are there are these moments they sort of bring up short um, that really do have this sort of dark side to it, and that's not there in the film. But sort of instead, it's all kind of smoothed, I think. So so Klein's like going two ways on it, and. Uh, yeah, I mean, out. one of the things that sort of struck me was, you know, I, I've, I found absolutely terrible. It's right at the beginning of the movie, obviously. Um, there's this ch the chase sequence, mm. um, you know, the, the bit, this big sort of showcase of, of all yeah. these intellectual properties we've, we've, we've got hold of. Um, and the, what that actually replaces is in the novel, you know, you've got this whole, the first clue is hidden on a, a, a planet full of schools because there's all this free education. So it's all this positive message about yeah. the utopian aspects and possibilities of this technology is totally wiped out by this car chase, you know, and it, it, I just thought that that really wound me up. Anyway, anyway I don't want to monopolize. I, I, I meant to say one other thing, by the way, and pick up another thing you said there, there Matthew, which is a really good point as well, which is about the ability to build um, within the book, everyone can build their own worlds. Everyone can get their own planet or their own little asteroid and they can decorate it. And it's a sort of Minecraft meets war, war, um, uh, what do you call it? World of Warcraft, isn't it? Um, whereas in, in the film, that's completely lost. It's all pre-built. There's no suggestion they can build their own worlds in there at all. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's quite, it, there's, there's a very diff, interesting difference between the two texts. Thank you. So there's a question in the chat here from Vincent Gain, uh, who says, thanks for three great papers. And the question he uh, wants to uh, address to Krista, in actual fact, uh, uh, which is this, and I'm reading his text now. Spielberg laughingly, laughably describes the 80s as an apolitical. Do you see the popular culture references as nostalgic for 80s politics of Western capitalist values? when there was a clearly defined but now absent communist adversary. Adversary? Have I said that right, Vincent? Yeah, uh, no, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> well, obviously, unless, unless you're Fisher, I, 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 because I think who it's aimed at, I think that it's definitely um, nostalgic for, for those values, but not, not with any acknowledgement of of an adversary, I don't think. I, I, you know, I'm more cynical than that about it. I don't, I don't think it acknowledges that at all. Actually, for me, for me, I don't see any acknowledgement of that in the text at all. Okay, thank you. 
Do you want to follow that up, Vincent? <clears throat> um, yeah, can do. Um, I, I mean, fair enough. I mean, uh, it was just something that sort of occurred mm. to me just because it kind of ties into my own um, uh, research into nostalgia for the Cold War. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I think I think you're right. Um, the film doesn't. Uh, the film seems um, so totally imbued and in love with the um, the, the popular uh, cultural references that it's almost. I suppose it's interesting that um, while the reason I refer to Spielberg describing the '80s as apolitical as laughable is because uh, yeah, it was a highly political time. But it's interesting that almost through this popular culture. It, um, emphasis um, the there's a um, there's a depoliticization as it were and in doing so is it um, depoliticizing 80s period but therefore in a, because it's impossible to be non-political um, inevitably the politics of um, I haven't read the book but I will imagine that the politics of that uh, of its time publication and then the politics of the film's production they mm. seep into it and come across probably um, in different ways. So as is, I guess, always the case, you've got the case of if something is historical, it's not really going to express the politics of its period, but the period of its production. And the case of something which is futuristic, and this, I guess, ties to um, what Matthew was saying as well, um, it's not being um, utopian, it's being highly dystopian, which tends to be the case, at least in science fiction film, which dystopias seem to make more obvious stories than um, mm dystopias, sorry, dystopias more than, than utopias. Um, so I suppose in that respect, um, there's a there's an imbuing and an expression of the particular politics of um, you know, 2017, 2018 mm -hmm. in that regard. As you say, I, I really liked your idea of, you know, it's the good and the bad type of capitalist. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, and Matthew's right, yeah. and Matthew's right that the book's more utopian, but in a quite a worrying way sometimes. It's got a flip side to it. It is utopian, but there's a sort of bit of a big butt looming over it. Um, yeah. And he's also right, which is a bit I cut out because of time, actually, from the, from the uh, presentation. But once, once Wade gains control of the oasis, what he does is um, reinvents 19th century um, social reform. He invents the weekend, two days off, and he invents, um, and he, uh, um, uh, um, bans debtors' prisons, which is nice. <laughs> mm. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. And there's a, a note um, from Matthew in the chat here where he says, there's a great interview with Spielberg when he says how much he loves the 1980s. It was a, quote, boom town for him personally. Totally looks over the AIDS crisis, mm -hmm. for example. So any other questions? for our three speakers today. Okay, well, unless I see any hands up, I think we'll draw to a close there as we're one speaker down and we still have a few minutes to go. So- Oh, you um, just one question there for Deary. Oh, one's just arrived. Oh, great. Helen Morgan Harmett, who says, this is a question for Jury. Jury, do, do you theorize the role of gender at all in this film, particularly as so much of the early film trades in this in the shifting norms around gender and spatiality in urbanization? Does that play at all into how you are theorizing the archival effect? Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, that's kind of a good point and it's kind of a blind spot in uh, Czech film studies as really the feminist film studies are uh, mainly focused on later decades and not really on early film and yeah uh, if we take uh, the definite Jamie Barron's definition of archive effect literally it's of course can show us how the norms of depicting the gender relations have changed, how the temporal and intentional disparity, uh, of course, uh, is visible and the archival footage makes us realize that. Uh, it's just that it's not really my focus as I was really focusing on the meta aspect on what the materiality does with it, what, uh, 
uh, sure, maybe if we focus on, uh, and it's just on the top of my head, yeah. Uh, maybe if we like to show how this uh, sort of heteronormative or patriarchal representation can be, can be disrupted, not only by some kind of figurative, more literal appropriation, but also by scratching, it can be uh, used even for deconstructed feminist criticism, but it's just really on the top of my head. I don't know really if I ask that question, but uh, yes, uh, I think the archive effect is also appropriate for these kinds of questions. It can, it can show us how the norms of representing even phenomena such as can, uh, a representation of females can change and how can we deconstruct the representation and show various points of view. Is it clear? Thank you, Jury. I think uh, Krista has a question she'd like to ask you. I, I do. Um, it's it's about this idea of the archival effect. And I, I saw, um, I don't know if people have seen it, I saw um, The Serpent, new BBC series, The Serpent, um, recently. And it's set in the 70s. And it uses quite a lot of what is quite clearly archival footage. And there was somebody talking uh, uh, yesterday as well about that, um, the confessions of a serial killer series and the use of archive. And I was just wondering, whether you have any insights into the way in which that sort of archival effect plays when it's dropped into other texts, particularly fiction texts, because obviously in the context of documentary texts, it's kind of a, a given, it's a marker of authenticity, isn't it, and so forth. But within a fiction text, it's quite a, an odd thing. Do you have any thoughts about that? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, again, uh... Dostavinsko is actually a, a, a fictional word, but I understand what you uh, what you're getting at. Uh, and of course, there are many uh, papers which follow up on Jamie Barron's notion of the archive effect. And one of them is an analysis analysis of JFK or Oliver Stone's Stone's film, where he uses these kinds of uh, like staged reenactments that are meant to look as if they were archival documents and they are shown next to or side by side with the real footage just to show us how the official way in which these uh, events were shown isn't the only version of the truth and of course it's quite common there is this um, and i also made a video essay that is on a Czech film, this journey about the Holocaust that makes all these sort of interventions into Triumph of the Will, which uh, the director uh, combines with footage of concentration camps and the ironic party commentary to really show that the rep uh, uh, not the representation of Nazism as it was officially meant to be, but with the knowledge of how it ended. So it's these kinds of inserting or doctoring found documents or working with the archival documents subversively can be still a really powerful way to make us aware of these concepts. Yet also there is the other side of the story that sometimes uh, this uh, falsification of the archive effect is shown in some kind of paranoid on conspiracy documentaries that show that Holocaust didn't even happen. So there's this two sides mm -hmm. of the story and mm -hmm. Baby Barron uh, also developed this idea quite nicely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there's a question in the chat from Brunella, a question for Krista again. Uh, she says, amazing paper. I haven't seen Ready Player One, but I wanted to know if you believe Spielberg displays okay. some sort of nostalgia for his own work in the 1980s. I mean, his ability to tell stories that are now trite. Sorry, something's just come in. It's now trite. Mm, don't know whether he sees them as trite. Um, well, what's quite interesting is that um, almost inevitably, because there's all this 
pop culture ref references left, right and centre. Um, there are quite a lot of Spielberg references in there. And um, according to the interview material and so forth, um, he actually didn't want to put to fill it up with references to his own films. And there was some kind of game went on where various production assistants would be sneaking in T-Rexes left, right, and center. You know, he was he only discovered half of them. I imagine he saw the T-Rex was quite big, but he only discovered some of the references to his own films once actually um, in the edit because they'd been sticking these things in on the sides of the frames. So there was some kind of weird game going on. It, it, Looking at he, he, what he says about it, yeah, nostalgia, those stories. There's an interesting interview with Spielberg um, where he says he really regrets uh, rebooting E.T. and he thinks it was a massive mistake to go back and, and that is absolutely to do with nostalgia because he said there was lots of really bad reactions to what he did because people said, no, 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 that was, that, that, that's my film, that's my version of my film and you can't go in there and faff with bits of it because then it's not the film I remember. And it, so he, there is a, a recognition in that, that actually in a way, it's that thing of it, isn't it about who becomes the owner of a text, that that text is no longer his text. That text belongs to all the people who watched E.T. as a kid and he doesn't have the right to play with it. So he's, he says he's on record saying he really regrets doing that and he will never do that again. He will never go back to a previous film again. So I've no idea if that answers your question, but it's, kind of interesting. Thank you. It does. <laughs> Great. Okay. Any further questions for our speakers this afternoon? Okay. So um, I think we'll draw this to a close. It's 1536. 